2022-2023 basketball season at Tougaloo College in Tougaloo, Mississippi, just north of the capital city, Jackson. These young men were a part of the Bulldogs' historic basketball season. Trey John Fielder, Cameron Woodall, and Cameron Copeland. They were a team of firsts. First time going undefeated in conference play, 14-0. First 30-plus win season, 32-2. First NAIA Regional Championship and first Elite Eight appearance in NAIA National Tournament. All done with a first-time head coach, each with a unique story to tell. A story that prepared them for center court and for a historic season. We begin with the players, turning pain into purpose through their play on court. I had an incident in my life that, you know, almost ended my career, but Coach Billups, Coach Strutt never gave up on me. They, they made sure I uh, fought through it to be able to keep playing. You'd never know it by looking at his ability to make three-pointers, but number 27, Trey John Fielder, was shot five times. February 3rd, 2020, I went to pick up my sister from a birthday party, and altercations started outside, and as I'm sitting in my car, I was hit by three or four stray bullets. I was hit three times in the leg, and two times in the hand that should have got my fingers amputated. I have no feeling in my middle finger, and I have no feeling in the top of my left finger. They were supposed to get amputated, but um, I told the doctor, you know, if I can keep it, you know, I think I can still play, even if I can't feel it, I can guide the ball with it. And he was like, yeah. okay, I'll let you keep it. That was one of the only days I ever seen my dad cry real tears. Like, those tears right there, was, it was just something about them. It made me, it was like, it was telling me that I'm not gonna stop. Waking up in the hospital and seeing Coach, Tru Coach Billups at the end of my bed, seeing my mom and dad laying on one small couch together, you know, making sure I'm good. When, when that happened, I knew I couldn't stop. Of course, it wasn't easy, you know. Started off when I left the hospital in a wheelchair, left there, got in crutches. Once I was done, able to walk, I was like, okay, I'm able to walk, so it's time, it's time to speed walk. After speed walk, it's time to jog. After jog, it's time to run. And after that, I was like, okay, now with the hand, hand therapy. After I got done with hand therapy, I was like, it's time to touch the ball. So once I got done with the ball, you know, I started putting up shots. So I'm gonna keep working to improve and let that, you know, that's gonna be my, my testimony. You know, had one big, you know, block in the row, got that out of the way, and now I'm back on the court and two championships later, I feel great. Cameron Woodall, or Big Cam as his coaches call him, lost a family member, a brother, affectionately known as number five. I don't show it all the time, but when I get by myself, then it, it'll hit me every now and then. I wear a necklace for him, as a matter of fact, and I got it on right now. Can I see it? Number five. Number five? This one. And what's the five? That was his number in high school. And he played? He played at Tier High School, and he got on the wrong track. But before he got killed, he was actually finna come here. And he was hanging with the wrong crowd. And I had got that call by two o'clock in the morning. What did you do when you got the call? Just broke down. Broke down and went and sat by myself for a whole 24 hours. I actually came and sat right there in the corner and cried. I thought about what he would want. He wouldn't want me sitting here crying. Cause he'd tell me, big boy, why you crying? And he'd be like, Man, you know you can't beat me on the court. And then I'd think about it, <laughs> act like I'm playing him one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, i think about him every day. Lil Cam, or Cameron Copeland, knows all too well about second chances. Coming from Montevello in Alabama, that was my sophomore year. I sat out two years, I kind of gave up on basketball. It was my first time actually coming into conflict with the coach and the court and then like being away from home. So I was in Alabama. I was still young. I wasn't matured all the way yet. And I was more so like, ah, I didn't know what to do. I was stressed every day. And I just gave up, went to Atlanta. I got a job, got an apartment, got a car, and I was just living. And when I got a second chance, I was already thrown in the real world. And so, I knew I didn't want that life anymore. 
like working at a factory, working at Amazon, working at CarMax. So when I come in the gym, I always remember that. So I go hard for that reason. And somebody seen me in Atlanta and they seen me at a local gym and they said, come try out. I text my mom immediately. I was shocked. I started crying. I, you know, I got a second chance and I was just like, I was grateful. He gave me a second chance, him and Coach Strick. Plus, Copeland lost someone dear to him. I lost my best friend in 2017 in a car accident. So I kind of play for him every game. What was his name? Amar. Yeah. So every game you think about? Every game. Their coaches are no strangers to pain either, and the former criticism or doubt, especially assistant coach Thomas Billups. People say I'm too hard on them, uh, they can't play for me, but the one that did play for me, they probably got good jobs right now, they overseas, or most of them in the pros. So it's a big part of you know why I'm able to play and shoot like I am today and also take tough coaching because my dad was a tough coach himself. You know? He was tough on me, so taking the coaching from Coach Billups, Coach Strutt, Coach Neal is, is easy. I want to see our black kids do well. And I always tell people when I see black coaches coaching in high school or in college or in the pros, I'm always for them. After he yells at you, he's going to tell you, like, you know I care about you. And you like can't be mad at him after he says that. Like, like sometimes I be trying to hide my laugh or my smile, but it just breaks and I can't. I'm making sure that they graduate, make sure they go to class, uh, you know, and make sure that they is okay with books and things like that. It fires you up sometimes, but it sometimes it will get on your skin, but most time it, it you know, it get me to where I pick up the speed. When you let the kids know that you'll do anything for them, uh, they'll leave everything on the floor for you. Uh, they won't stop, they won't ever quit playing for you. I actually look at myself and say to myself, you're supposed to do that in the first place. Well, they just like my son. I didn't treat my son no different. He played for me four years, and I didn't. my daughter played volleyball for me for two years. I didn't treat them no different. He gonna give me the stare down, he know I don't like it. I just put my head down, act like I don't see it, and mumble under my jersey. Head coach, Eric Struthers. I think Billups a more old school coach, and I'm a more new school kind of coach. I'm more relaxed. They just want the best for you. And that's, that's what I love about them. When I let them get away with lit things and I talk to them about it, and I'm, I'm a quiet, I'm, a, I'm quiet, but I'm really tough on them. But I give him, I give him a lot of love. You know what I'm saying? But he shows that he cares. So I like that a lot. I never had that before in the coach. That after he yell at you, right afterwards he come to you after practice. He'll tell you. All of this tough love and discipline comes under the helm of former Tugaloo basketball player and current Tugaloo athletics director Keith Barnes. Well, I'm an alumna of Tugaloo. We had some very Fun years here. But Barnes says he understands discipline and Coach Struthers and Bill of strictness. He says Tugaloo has always taught its students and players to be tough and stand up for what's right, citing the Tugaloo Nine, a group of African American students who led and staged sit ins in segregated public institutions in Mississippi back in the early 60s. Having heard about and witnessed some of that, uh, those civil rights marches and protest and so on and so forth, it was ingrained in us from very early uh, on that we needed to stand, stand for what was right. We needed to be a voice for those who could not speak. And we needed to assist wherever we could to be um, proponents of justice. So, you know, it, it was just ingrained. We had no, no option but to fall in the footsteps of some of the greats. Did you know an elephant can outrun Usain Bolt? Or that these beautiful birds of paradise flowers originated in Africa? Ever tried this dish, Jola? From animals to birds and food, let's explore Ghana together with Nobel Peace Prize winner Kofi Annan as our guide. He'll teach us about the importance of education and why each young boy and girl should seek peace and their rightful place as kings or queens. This book will inspire you and your little ones to pack a bag and get ready to travel across the Atlantic Ocean 
It's time to dance to a different drum, the Peace Drum, a Kofi tale. Available on Amazon now. The win is not always the ultimate, uh, but competing is. What makes each of these men unique? A winner's mindset. We wanted to see where this championship mentality came from, so we traveled to the coach's hometown, Vicksburg, Mississippi. <laughs> Head coach Eric Struthers grew up on Struthers Drive in Warren County, Mississippi. It was like four or five founders that developed this, this, this area, and then this was the, the street was named after the, the people that developed the area. It's Struthers Drive, which is one of the founders, was Percy Struthers. He didn't grow up playing basketball. In Dunning Brown, back then I was kind of like a nerd, and uh, he taught me how to play the game of chess. And, uh, and I played the game of chess a lot, and I learned a lot. And he really got me into the sports, but he got me into playing golf. And, uh, and we used to play golf in his backyard. This is this, this house right here, uh, where he grew up with, Dunning Brown. He used to have a sand pit, and we used to hit golf balls. And I think I was around the fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, and I was really learning how to play golf. So uh, he was really one of the guys that got me into playing basketball, playing football, and they always said he was a year or two ahead of me. So you always looked up to the, the older guys in your neighborhood, and uh, he really brought out the competitive um, drive in me uh, because after that, you know, I just competed in every aspect of whatever I did, including playing on the gridiron. Yes, Struthers played football in high school. He was a Vicksburg Gator, coached by his now assistant head coach, Thomas Billups. I started football back in the seventh grade. So I played football seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Cause I, that was my passion. I, I wanted to play football. I wanted to be a, a Vicksburg Gator. It helped me to be really a physical player. And anybody played against me, they'll know that I'm a rough and physical player. my family, uh, uh, my mother, my sister, my father, my son, and, and my daughter. It's a, a family portrait, and my mom liked to do family portraits. My mother was a school teacher, and her friends, they really pushed me academically and then athletically. Uh, and then uh, I really had a really powerful church that stood behind me, a uh, Jack Street Baptist Church. My father, he went to war, and he, he fought for our country, and then he told me when he came back, you know, he got put off the bus uh, when he was coming back. To come back home, they put him off the bus. But actually, uh, he joined the Army at 16, you know, when he was supposed to be at 18. He did it because he was starving. I think back then they was having a um, uh, recession and he had no work, so he just joined the Army. Struthers wanted to join the military himself, but his father would not let him. His father blew the whistle, so to speak, on his career path. At the time, Coach Strutters stood five foot eight inches tall. Then came a growth spurt. And I grew to about six feet going into the 12th grade, and I tried my hand in a little basketball. I got hurt maybe the fourth game of the season, and then after that, um, I didn't play basketball anymore. And then uh, I trickled over to Jackson State, where I wanted to play football for W.C. Gordon. Um, but once I looked out on the field and saw those guys and saw how big they were, I said, there's no way I can make, make the team in Jackson State football. So one of my best friends, Harold Gibbons, uh, bet me that I couldn't make the team in Jackson State. But by that time, I went from six feet to about six, seven. And then eventually I was six, eight. I was able to make the team. And um, from there, it was pretty much history. I had a good, a good uh, run at Jackson State. He won the bat. He was a walk-on at Jackson State University, becoming MVP his junior and senior years. We actually the only team to win the conference championship and the tournament championship in the same year. So that's in Jackson State history. He played professionally. I went and tried out with the Hawks and they, the Hawks cut me and I had to come home. It was kind of a low point for me. Uh, you know, after that, I didn't know what, what direction I was gonna go in. And uh, actually, I got a call and I got a chance to go overseas. He was even inducted into Jackson State and Southwestern Athletic Conference, or SWAT, Hall of Fame. I think I was an above average player. Uh, 
I think I was good for the team that I played on. Uh, I think uh, I really contributed uh, and I led the team in scoring and rebound my junior year, so that makes me pretty good. And then by my senior year, I led the team in rebound and I was second on the team in scoring. Each milestone coming with grit and grind. He was an assistant coach for more than 20 years, overlooked for head coaching positions at his alma mater and Mississippi Valley State University. I've been passed over a couple times, but one thing that I do know, timing is everything. And I think that God put me in the right space at the right time. And I always tell everybody, God is never early and he's never late. So he's always on time. A university is like a town, and the president like the mayor. But in this town, the mayor just doesn't govern. She gives back to the residents, the students. When you can look at Wall Street and make decisions, that's when you're really contributing back. So how do you rise to the top to be the first female leader of an educational institution? And how do you lead the first female African-American sorority? Plus, fight for social justice issues all at the same time? It's easy when you're born to lead. For those people who say, well, of course he was gonna have a good first year. I mean, Billups took him to a championship before that, and he stayed on. Is he really coaching his first year? What do you say? I say, I don't want credit for anything. I was the head coach. My guys respected me. They respected the system that we played under. And, uh, and as we played more and more, as we, we won more and more, they got more and more comfortable with me and my style of coaching. I always say uh, Coach Billups is the GOAT of coaching. And I, I always say uh, he's Kobe and I'm Shaq. Uh, he's Batman and I'm, I'm Robin. So uh, we just switch roles and we, we still coach the same. And during practice, I, he'll begin practice and our end practice. So it's a good combination. We work really good together. So he's my mentor and he's like a father to me. So it's really easy stepping into his shoes. But it's not easy following a legend because you had to do well because it, it's tough following the Coach Billups. The things that he done for this community and teams that he took to the championship, it was really tough. But I was built for that. Why or how? How? Because where I came from. I came from Vicksburg, Mississippi. We work hard there. Struthers kept working hard and striving for greatness, which led him to Tougaloo College, a private historically black college and university with notable graduates such as Congressman Bonnie Thompson, Reuben Anderson, the first black judge to sit on the Mississippi Supreme Court, Aaron Shirley, founder of Jackson Medical Mall and recipient of MacArthur Award, and Joan Mulholland, civil rights activist and first white student. Lawrence, with a history-making mindset himself. I was the first African-American principal at St. Joseph Catholic High School in Madison. That was the history-making mark for me. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, the journey was interesting. And when you, if you told me I would have journeyed through that or matriculated through that particular um, situation like I did, I would have, when I started, I would have told you no. But um, it happened, and um, I thank God for it. That strength from the ancestors plays a tremendous role in the tenacity the team displays on the court. That was the first time asked me going to Kansas and the Sweet 16. We told each other, we got each other back no matter what. Refs, coaches, team stand, and we made it to the Elite Eight. But to me, I feel like we played our hearts out. It was a good feeling going into New Orleans. That first game was wild. We won, and we won by double digits. But it felt good to see everybody smiling, Coach Billups smiling, because you know he don't smile, and he always on us. Coach Strutt got to go in serious mode again. Hey, curfew at this time, this and this, don't come out. You'll never know what it's like to run 17s at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning when you're running suicides and everything, keeping us conditioned to uh, do what we want to do on the court. And that's run, we were a fast paced team. And teams would be tired trying to keep up with us because that's what we did. And thanks to the coaches, we were used to it. Coach Trump, I his mindset was set on national championship. Conference championship didn't seem like it would be nothing to win for him. And I, I joke with him all the time about when we won the conference championship, 
and tears ran from his face. I always tell him, I said, that might have been the ugliest face I seen cry, but I'm glad I got tears out of you because he, he worked hard to get us there. He told us we would win. He told us automatically conference championship would be us. Like there was no doubt that we would win that. And he, he had his mindset on the national championship. While Coach Struthers gives God the credit for his success, he says his head coaching opportunity would not have been made possible without this man, Coach Billups. And I say, you know, this guy, he really should have been, should have had a head coaching job before now. And, but when he came to my school and after he did all this for me, Work my kids. I didn't never have to do as much as I did before when I first got him. I knew he could do the job, and somewhere down the line, wherever he put jobs in, I think they make the biggest mistake in their life for not having him. The one that want to win, the one that's in it just for the money and not for helping the kids, it's okay with him. But it pressure on the coach that want to win, that want to see his kids do good, and want his kid to graduate. It only takes one person to light a match, to make a change, bringing everyone together, one book at a time. She is showing children that no matter where you live, we are all unique in our own way. From teachable moments... Mississippi is in the southern part of the country. It is considered a southern state, a more rural and country part of the United States. To encouraging talks... We just use her imagination to think and to write. She's raising the spirits of the young. They pull up to a everywhere she goes. It's called teamwork, something the players say they'll carry with them throughout their professional and personal lives. I don't miss a day of workouts. So I feel like every day I go work on something. If it's balling, dribbling, rebound, post, no matter what. You can keep getting better and better. You can see your progress. There's something about that, that development stage that I like. Like if I go in the gym at five in the morning, and then we have practice, I can see my progress. And then after that, I go, to, I go work out by myself again, and then the next day, it's like double. So I can see my game going higher and higher. Starting off young, when you come into college, you don't think putting in the work is you know, that big of a deal. But when you want to play, and you want to get as far as we did, the work, you have to. So the biggest thing is just missing the guys, you know, a lot of the young ones. They just, it's their turn now, they have to step up. But I'll be here to support. <laughs> What's next for this historic team? I think we're going to put together a really good team for next year. we got some good players, and our system is already in, so it, it ain't like they got to learn a new system. So I think if we start off good, we'll finish strong. Coach Struthers and his assistants, Thomas Billups, John Neal, and Chris Stevens, set the bar pretty high in Struthers' first season as a head coach. Struthers says it was all done with discipline. What are you? define as discipline? Well, discipline, and I talk about, it goes back to character. What is your character when nobody's watching? What would you do? You're gonna go, you're gonna get in the bed and curfew. You're gonna go to study hall. You're gonna go into the weight room and you're gonna do your amount of reps. So that I base discipline on, on character. And so our story ends how it began with hope and discipline. I see us being national champions at least two of the next five years. It's something that has never been done. And so it was inevitable that they make the run or did what they did this year. The one thing that I would 
really like for these young men to take from this experience is, it's only once in a lifetime that you get a chance to do what they've done. I want to keep on winning. Until I leave, until I leave and retire. And then when I retire, if I'm still, my health's still good, I'm still gonna work with kids. I tell my guys, and we are a big family. So anytime you play under me, um, you work under me, you are part of my family. And you know, family, I think, if family come together, you can be stronger than anything. I tell my players, I can't treat all y'all the same, but I can be fair. And they respected it, and we, we won with that. A university is like a town, and the president like the mayor. But in this town, the mayor just doesn't govern. She gives back to the residents, the students. When you can look at Wall Street and make decisions, that's when you're really contributing back. So how do you rise to the top to be the first female leader of an educational institution? And how do you lead the first female African-American sorority? Plus, fight for social justice issues all at the same time? It's easy when you're born to lead.